Okay, I think we're on. In case you didn't know, I'm Lois Oliver. It said on all those signs out there. And um, so I'm going to be uh, telling you about women in medicine. And remember that we're talking the 1960s. <laughs> when I decided to explore going to medical school, I made an appointment with the Dean of Admissions at the University of Pittsburgh Medical School. He listened to my story, which was nursing, uh, bachelor's degree, master's degree. Uh, he said, after thinking, he said, we don't take students from trade schools. I was taken aback having two degrees from his university. He did then tell me that I needed three courses I had not had as an undergrad, organic chemistry, physics, and calculus. I went to see the dean of late afternoon and evening classes, which is sort of adult education, which allowed working adults to take courses. Since I needed labs for two of the courses, he said I should go <laughs> to the dean of the arts and sciences and ask for permission to take the courses during the day under the aegis of the late afternoon and evening classes. After a bit of arguing, he agreed and gave me a signed note for the registrar that I was allowed to register for these courses. So I took these courses over the next year. I really lucked out. First, I resigned from my teaching role, making the nursing professor furious as she saw doctors as the enemy, you know, keeping nurses down. Uh, then the grapevine turned up two surprising helpers. The director of nurses called me in to say that she was thrilled that I was doing what I was doing, and she would, if I could work any shift I wanted, and she would pay me the head nurse's salary for it. The chief of pediatric surgery called me in. He offered to write a letter of recommendation for me, but made me assure him that I would not become a psychiatrist. Then came going back to 26 undergrad at 26 to undergraduate courses was challenging. After two organic chemistry lectures, I realized that in six years they had learned quite a lot of chemistry that I had had. I told the professor I should probably just give it up. He said he would tutor me to catch up. We met for two hours, three times, and he was so good that I got an A in organic chemistry. Then physics, which was taught by a grad student who wasn't very good, I was sitting next to a high school student who was taking it as an AP course. He offered to help me, and after each class, we sat on the steps outside, and he translated the lecture for me. He did so well that I got a B minus in physics. <laughs> Calculus was without help, and I only managed to see. Still, my overall GPA was 3.4. So I applied to several medical schools and heard from none until January when I was invited to an interview at Pitt at my alma mater. The interview was a interviewer was a basic scientist. He listened to my story and then talked for the rest of the hour. He told me the faculty would not help me nor would my fellow men students be helpful. They will not treat you like a colleague, but as an interloper. He went on that vein for the whole time. So when I left, I assumed he was not gonna recommend me <laughs> for admission. And then suddenly in March, I got an acceptance letter. When I finally made it to medical school and on a lovely fall September day, I joined my classmates in an auditorium for the beginning of orientation. I looked around and, of course, was hoping to see other women in my class. As it happened, there were six women in my class, and six in each class ahead of me, and six for several years after that, before women began gradually being admitted in proportion to their application. Years later, I learned that the year I applied, 13 women applied and 1,100 men. I had competitive grades and a graduate degree, although it was in nursing, 
and not seen as quite as serious as biochemistry. <laughs> also, I did not know the intensive prep for the MCAT that pre-meds did, but took it with more than a scanty, or a little more than a scanty review. My scores were sort of average. As it happened, seven of the accepted candidates withdrew to go to other schools, and to meet the quota, they admitted me. So, it's a little affirmative action. At the orientation coffee hour, I was asked to meet to visit the Dean of Students. When I did, he gave me a brief lecture about my science weakness and urged me to study diligently. I was very annoyed, but said I would. Next came an interview with a local newspaper who was doing an article about the new medical school class. Much to my surprise, I was asked to join another new woman student and a photographer took pictures of us. The next day, there we were, Sally and I, oldest, 27, youngest, 19, tallest, 5'10", shortest, 4'10". <laughs> and there we were on the, in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Our classes started the next day, and I learned that we were always sorted in alphabetical order. The first semester with gross anatomy, histology, neuroanatomy, and a few hours of non-science courses. Uh, each course had a, an hour lecture followed by at least two hours of lab. In the case of gross anatomy, ca cadaver dissection could go on as long as you wanted to stay, and that lab was open 24 hours a day. I really liked gross anatomy and enjoyed learning microscopic anatomy and other courses. Also, I felt helped by, by faculty and classmates. After six weeks, we had exams in all the courses that were taken at the time. Two days later, we found cards on our cadaver. <laughs> uh, on one side was your name, and on the other side was a number. I asked what the number was, and they said, it's your class rank. Mine was a five. So I took the card to the dean um, of students and handed him the card and asked if he was still worried. Uh, he, he turned quite red, and then he said, congratulations. Mingling took place in the snack bar, which was on a level with the library, and became a hub for coffee and daytime studying in the library. Since I liked coffee and conversation, I was in the snack bar by eight-ish. None of the other women appeared before the first lecture, but I soon made friends with the men who did. A surprise announcement a month after we started was that a wealthy woman uh, alum had given a gift to the Dean of Students of money to be used for all women students for a luncheon together periodically. So the senior students took charge and all 24 of us ate lunch at some place really nice about five times a year until the money ran out. <laughs> After the first semester, uh, 10 men had either left or were encouraged to do so. Then in the spring, I was called to the dean's office. A wealthy donor had given um, fellowships to graduate students, and the medical school had gone to court to have professional students included in this grant, uh, and, and, and they got the right to do that. But, the stipulations in this grant were, are you ready? White, male, uh, Protestants, residents of Allegheny County. <laughs> uh, this, you, the, the university went back to court to challenge these rules, and so, and they picked, uh, and they had picked five of my class to get one of these new fellowships. 
the group was John, a Roman Catholic. So he was everything else, but he was not a Protestant. Uh, me, a woman. Uh, Fred, he was everything, but he wasn't a resident of Allegheny County. Uh, and Art, uh, from, was a Jew from the Bronx. So uh, each of us, are you ready? Got $5,000 a year for four years. And all we had to do, and the, the check came to us, not to the school. <laughs> all we had to do uh, was go to court every year to testify that we were making satisfactory academic progress. This grant, plus my ability to work summers and weekends as a nurse, uh, really allowed me to graduate with less than $10,000 in debt. <laughs> I did gradually get to know the women over the first semester, and it was a surprise to me to find how different we really all were in our motivation and our goals. Barbara was from a nearby town, and she was aiming to be a practicing physician. She mostly kept to herself and was, of course, on a cadaver with three men. She said they were not mean or critical, but in general, the table got along well. She almost never stayed late or came in on weekend. She did well and eventually decided to have a career in radiology. She trained at Pitt and went back to her hometown to work in her local hospital. She married a couple of years later. Her husband de decided that it was dangerous to do radiology, so he made her quit. And she ended up doing well baby clinics and school physicals. Patricia grew up in a mill town along the Allegheny River. These towns were home to steel workers and there were rows of identical dark sooty houses. Pat did not want anyone, any of us, to know this. She had gone to Vassar for her undergrad and she proudly wore a Vassar a class ring, hoping, I think, we would all think that she was from a middle-class family who were helping her or supporting her. She did live at home while in med school and rode the public streetcars and buses back and forth. I had a car and often offered to give her a ride home, but she would only let me take her to the bus stop. Once, when the weather was terrible and I insisted, we did go to her house, and she made me promise forever that I would never tell anyone where she lived. <laughs> she, was a good, she was an excellent student, and when she graduated, she, she went to the University of Minnesota for her training she did uh, pediatrics and pediatric infectious disease, and she rose over the years through the ranks, the full professor in, in uh, sort of all of her research was in the uh, area of uh, newborn infections. Then there were the other three, none of whom wanted to be actual doctors. Anita was a good athlete playing basketball and golf as an undergrad. Her brother was a senior in med school when we started, and her father was a practicing physician. Her father insisted she go to medical school and give up phys ed teaching. She obeyed and, in general, suffered her way through medical school. She was, she was a good student, but she really, obviously, didn't care for it. <laughs> She did a residency in pathology and took a position at, at, at a university hospital and became a regional expert on reading surgical biopsies. I mean, she had referrals from all over the area. She, sadly, she developed an aggressive cancer and died at age 35. The class had a memorial service for her and we were all in agreement with our class president when he said, since her life was to be so short, why couldn't she do what she wanted to do? 
Sally was the tiny girl, the four foot tenor, and she always had problems getting faculty and patients to take her seriously. She was the oldest of eight children and finished high school at 16. She fell in love with a man who was in college when they met, and she planned to marry as soon as she graduated from high school. By that time, her father was just starting a veterinary school at the University of Pennsylvania, and her family insisted that she wait uh, until, he, until he graduated. So she decided to go to medical school. <laughs> and that would fill her time until she could get married. When she graduated, she did a rotating internship and then they did marry. Despite her lack of interest, she began working as an emergency room doctor. It was not a specialty then, it was just, she was working in ERs, usually weekends and occasional evenings. She had three children and only worked when her husband could take care of the children. When emergency medicine became a specialty, she was grandmothered in to take the emergency medicine board exam and aced it. So she ended up with her uh, specialty. Jerry's family expected her to go to work after high school. and she wanted to go to college, so she left home. She got a full tuition scholarship to Pitt, but had no support for living. She took a night housekeeper position. She, she went to class all day, studied in the library in the evening, and went to work at 11. She would finish her work by three to four a.m. and then sleep in an empty bed in the university hospital. Luckily, uh, she did this most of her freshman year. She was homeless. Uh, luckily, there was a postdoc uh, teaching assistant in her lab, and they fell in love <laughs> and quickly married. Of course, he had an apartment, so now she was no longer homeless. He took a faculty position at a, a a, a university, and they thought, uh, he thought, that they wouldn't both, this always makes me laugh, be hired by the same university, an MD and a PhD, I mean, a, a two PhDs. But if one had an MD and the other had a PhD, then that would be possible. So he convinced her to go to medical school. So Jerry came to medical school and was my lab partner for uh, two years. We were always alphabetized and her last name was Pincus and mine was Pound, so we are always <laughs> together. We bonded over gross anatomy because she would not do dissection. <laughs> so I dissected while she studied the book. Was, you have to know Jerry to appreciate that. And she's telling me what I'm doing and I'm doing it, right? Then over Christmas, I bagged medical school because I, I did nursing work to get money, right? <laughs> and then over Christmas, she came in and dissected the lower leg, which I have never understood because it was all dissected when they got. Uh, anyway, Jerry tutored me in biochemistry from which she was exempted, and so we were, uh, she, was, she was just a special kind of uh, woman in that, you know, I think all of us knew that she had written some very fine research papers when she was a, an undergrad and um, that she was interested in research, not taking care of patients. When she graduated, she did an internship in internal medicine and then four years of pathology. Her husband took a faculty position at Boston University. <laughs> and so Jerry did her last two years of pathology at Harvard. 
She's been there ever since, rising through the ranks to full professor and he heading a major cancer and immunology research areas. She and Jack had no children, and I still hear from her every year, including this one. And that is women in medicine in the 60s. <laughs> short, it's a little short, but I told, I told uh, Joe it was gonna be short. Any questions? Uh, what happened to me? <laughs> Well, I, when I finished uh, medical school, I, you know, I, I had been a pediatric nurse, and I had a wonderful uh, faculty advisor who was not popular with the rest of the world, uh, but, I mean, his, his nickname was Black Jack. He was a really scary professor, but I was torn, torn between internal medicine and pediatrics, and when I, and he, and he thought, I, I, I asked him what he thought, and he said, you need to go into pediatrics. Pediatrics has a bunch of idiots. They need some more internal medicine minds. <laughs> so I uh, did my internship uh, at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital uh, in pediatrics, and um, I, I decided, uh, I, I had applied to uh, a bunch of places, and, and I was happy that I was accepted at, at Penn, and, I, and it was a good year, but um, I really wanted to go to Children's Hospital in Boston, mainly for several reasons. My brother and his wife lived there. Uh, he was on the faculty at MIT, and it would just be, you know, I wouldn't be the only person I knew in the whole city or anywhere. And uh, I had applied before, so I applied during my internship. Oh, and I also had a, I had a, a little uh, uh, quarrel with the um, internship at, at Penn because it included, it was supposed to be all pediatrics but you had to do uh, three month, uh, a month of, 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 of OB. I don't know if they didn't have enough OB people or whatever, but anyway. So I decided that I was not gonna stick with them. So I applied to, back again to Children's Hospital in Boston, and when I did, they sent me a letter and said, well, you don't need to reapply. We already have your application from before. And, and I said, uh, so I don't need to do anything. And they said, well, yes. And so then uh, they finally, they invited me up for an interview. And I, my first interviewer was, God, I'm blocking out his name. Uh, well, my first interviewer was Sam Katz, who eventually came into Duke and was here forever. And, um, and he was sort of all excited because uh, he he was he he was just sort of amazed that somebody had come through nursing and then medicine, and he so he uh, and my other interviewer was an uh, uh, also seemed sort of. Um, he, he was a basic science person, but he was really uh, thoughtful. And so the next thing I know, I, they told me I would hear by October, by uh, November 1st, if I had been accepted. So November 1st came, or, or October 31st came, and uh, I mean, I didn't get any letter in between or anything, and I went down and finally, <laughs> I went to, uh, uh, I went down to, 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 I went to get my mail, and uh, the, uh, and, and there was no letter from them. And then, 
The next day, there was a letter. So I don't know if they mailed it later when I mean, the letter came and said that I had been accepted. So I went to Children's in Boston, and I, I did two years uh, there. I had done you know, an internship, and I needed two years uh, for my, to take my board exam. And I was, and I did take, um, I did take my board exam. And my best friend in residency was a, a man named Fred Mandel. And remember, this is the 60s. He got caught in the doctor draft. And he uh, decided, which I think was, I mean, I think it made him <laughs> happy all his life. He decided that he was not going to go and sit on Iwo Jima and take care of, you know, <laughs> wounded soldiers or whatever. So he enlisted in the Navy, and that was a four-year enlistment. And he was assigned to Japan. And while he was there, he wrote a book about uh, the, uh, I have, it's really a really good book. I mean, of course, I can't remember the name, but, but anyway. Uh, but so now my practice, I was going to go into practice with Fred, and now he was gone. So I stayed an extra year and did a year under a federal program of child development. And that turned out to be a pretty good year. And while I was doing that, <laughs> Uh, sometime in the spring, I guess, Sam Katz came up and stopped in my office and asked me if I would like to come on the faculty at Duke. And I said, you know, what would I do? I have no academic credentials. And he said, we'll think of something. And the problem at Duke at the time was the pediatric department was the chair was Jerry Harris, and it had uh, twelve faculty. I mean, can, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so he was reaching out to fill up his uh, faculty, and of course, because he was married to a woman physician, he. Uh, wanted to include women. <laughs> so so I came down here, and my first job, because of my um, child development thing, was I, uh, because they didn't have a something clear for me, I worked two days a week for the uh, state developmental program. I went to clinics and evaluated uh, children. And then, when I got back, <laughs> And I, he, we decided that I would run the, are you ready? <laughs> the clinic and the emergency room. And I did something which I always thought was great fun. The old Duke Hospital, which some of us remember, the emergency room had a surgeon as a, a, um, a, a, re, a, a person uh, that triaged the, pa the people when they came in. And uh, so the first irritating, and so they uh, put me in charge of emergency room and clinic, general pediatric clinic. <laughs> and and uh, I realized that I had been here for a year, or a part of a year, and I had never seen a child with child abuse. And I said, you know, this can't be the perfect place to live where nobody ever beats up on a kid. So I went over the emergency room and I discovered that no matter how old you were, if you were 30 months or 30 years and you had a broken arm, you went to the orthopedists. So I went to the chief of surgery, Dr. Sabaston, and I said, I want all children under the age of five to, get, to be seen by the pediatrician, be, and they will send them you know, to the orthopedist or whatever, if that's what they need, but they will. And suddenly, <laughs> we, 
we began to see quite a bit of child abuse. And one of the nurses said to me, you know, we never had child abuse before you came here. I was like, but you're a reputation. Anyway, so I, I ran the clinics for uh, uh, those years. And then I was recruited to Pittsburgh by the man who eventually became my husband. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't married any of this time. Anyway, that's how, that was my past. So I did, I taught, uh, there I ran the, the uh, we had a system which they, I think they have here too, the continuity clinic where the residents have their own practice. In, and, uh, and so I, I was in charge of all the emergency room and, and the, in the resident's clinical practice. So, and I had a small practice of my own who were mostly medical students or resident kids. Anyway, that's what I did. <laughs> we came back to Duke, we came back to Duke and, um, and we came back, I came back to Duke because my husband took a job a vice president of the American Board of Pediatrics, which is in Chapel Hill. And so I came back here as, uh, and they didn't have, they didn't need me in pediatrics anymore. They now had a department with lots of people in it. And so I became, they asked me to be associate dean for admissions, that was half time, and associate dean for students, that was half time. So I effectively was working two half-time jobs, and I did that until 1997. Yeah? The fact that there are the, the majority of people in medical school these days are women, it's, it's like uh, 60, 70 percent. It's absolutely, totally different. They're smarter. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm not sure that I know the answer to that question. Anyway, thank you all for coming. <laughs>